I'm not going to say much actually, but um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm the um, Eco Action team co chair along with Jane Houlihan. And Jane is in Georgia right now, had intended to be here, did a lot to pull us together. Uh, she's been visiting her sister who's not been well, and she had a flight scheduled to return last night. And I got a text from her saying that the, her flight had been canceled and she couldn't find another flight to get back here in time. So she's so disappointed not to be here. And Jane herself has a beautiful garden and she's a wonderful gardener and a wonderful human being. So she's with us in spirit. So our thanks to Jane too for helping to put this together. Um, and for those of you who came in later, um, thanks to Katrine Alones who put together this slideshow and to those of you who are here to submitted photos of things from your gardens or from uh, nearby forest places. Um, it's a beautiful show and it's really lovely to see. And I suppose had we thought ahead of time, we might've had Appalachian Spring playing in the background or something, but, but uh, or the choir, but anyway, it's beautiful to see these, so thank you. Um, so I will introduce our speaker in just a few minutes. You read a little bit about her in Crossroads, those who read Crossroads. Um, and before we do that, we have a few members of the parish and a few from, from um, our Eco Action team. Uh, who say a couple of words, just a very brief one or two minutes about why they garden and why they like gardening. So first I'm going to call upon our Eco Action Team member, Lydia Liu, to come up. I think you can see, so she can see over there that way, the Zoom folks can see. Yeah. Hi, everybody. For those who do not know me, my name is Lydia Liu. Um, I start. I heard about the native plants, uh, the concept of it before pandemic uh, at a neighborhood stormwater uh, management meeting. But I really, uh, the concept really took off and I start becoming practitioner is during the pandemic when I have time to get my hands dirty. So in 2022, that was two years ago, I planted milkweed and the, that summer, I saw the monarch butterfly, and later I had 30 something uh, butterfly caterpillars on my swamp milkweed. And that's the turning point for me. And I really discovered the joy and I realized the connection between the native plants and the ecosystem, I mean, our local ecosystem. So um, that year I witnessed like 10 something butterfly emerge from my garden. Uh, I was so inspired and I started, I mean, prior to that, I mean, I consider myself an environmentalist. So I donate to all kind of foundation, I mean, to help uh, speech, uh, to prevent species uh, extinction in Africa here, there, and uh, Chesapeake Bay, and I mean, reduce plastic use. But I didn't know, I mean, I don't, didn't feel the impact I mean, I, I can't sense how that actually helped. And when I saw the butterfly, I actually see my impact. So from then on, I, I just de devote my whole garden to native plants. So I plant lots of bushes, actually, even this weekend. Yesterday, I, I, I belong to the uh, Montgomery Native Plant People. It's a group community on Facebook, like have 3,000 members. And they grew all uh, organized group sale. So I picked up lots of plants, I mean, pl pluck, it, which is very uh, economic to do that with. But the whole journey just um, helped me to discover hope and joy and learn how to actually care, take care of God's creation. So I want to help others to discover the joy and thanksgiving. <laughs> to help other us as well. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Um, Lizzie. Lizzie Glidden Boyle, many of you know, is our garden person and flower, flower person here at St. John's. Lizzie? Thank you. Well, I feel like Lydia had said it all. <laughs> um, I think there's an inspiration that flowers give us and the environment gives us. And I think that's what Lizzie, Lydia was talking about. And I just am so in touch with what is around me and what I read about the pollinators and about the birds and the 
butterflies that are having trouble finding food anymore. And it just touches my heart. And I, um, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that you all will find this as well and that we can help you on eco action and that we'll be able to guide you. And one of the things that we could do is have a plant exchange, which we have in the back. And one of the, another thing we can do is there's an area in the front of the church just under our sassafras tree. And I'm sure you, you know about sassafras trees, right? No. The sassafras tree is one of the most beautiful, I think, tree with its characteristics. Because, first of all, my mother had a sassafras tree, and she, and a sassafras tree looks like this, the leaf, right? And I said, Mom, why do you like this sassafras tree? Well, she said, I'm going to make you a pair of mittens, and it's going to look like the leaf of the sassafras tree. So my mittens were not like none others. And I never lost my mittens. <laughs> so, but the characteristics about the sassafras tree are just extraordinary. First, it brings berries to the, um, for the birds. And second of all, it has three seasons, spring, winter, and fall. And the leaves are all different every single season. And we have one planted here. And on, in front of the church and underneath it is a lovely space that we can begin our planting of native plants. Thank you. I think I need to go now. <laughs> We have our guest speaker, so we kind of have like two minutes of sharing. So thanks, Lizzie. Okay, you can start. Yeah, now, as we all know. You can start my timer. <laughs> so I'm a, I, I'm a strange choice to come up here and talk on today when we're talking about gardening because the plants outside my door, I couldn't tell you what half of them are. I wouldn't know the names. But I do like to cook. And I like many cooks, I love fresh vegetables and fresh ingredients. So back during COVID, um, we we're all holed up and I had uh, a kid in the basement who just graduated from college with a degree in biology and uh, emphasis in plant physiology. Um, and what we did was we went out and pulled out some shrubs that were not doing much, just yanked them out, replanted some, and turned this four by 11 plot into a veggie garden. And we planted this early spring, so it was like arugula, radishes, stuff I could use in my cooking. And it started to come up. And we sat out there a lot of evenings for like an hour and looked at the little sprouts, which were amazing to see, and talked and stuff. You remember, we were all easily entertained during COVID. <laughs> sure enough, soon we had veggies. Um, the arugula, if you buy arugula at the store, it's nice. It has a little flavor. If you pull it out of the ground and serve it, um, Chris, too peppery for Krista to eat. Radishes, which I'd never thought about before. I mean, they're red and they're crunchy. Um, they have this wonderful taste. Who knew? I had never realized that. So um, this is easy to do. It's very useful. If nothing else comes up, green onions. You know, uh, recipes call for green onions, and I'd go to the store, and I'd buy a batch, and I'd use, like, two, and the rest would just turn into mush in the fridge because I wouldn't have another recipe like that for a week. Now I just go out with the kitchen knife, give the neighbors a thrill, and go out and whack, whack it chop them up, they go on. It's very satisfying. It's nice to have fresh veggies uh, to go in your recipes, um, particularly if you're vegetarian. Okay, that's my story. Did I, did I do too much? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And and, um, and I've asked Bob Buhar, I, I started seeing pictures of Bob's garden a couple of years ago on Facebook. And I know he's an avid gardener, so this morning I saw him. I said, speak for just a couple of minutes, Bob. He said, of course. Why not? Uh, 
No, I'm uh, I'm an avid gardener, but my wife is the photographer, so she puts everything up on Facebook. No, I'm much like Jay. I'm I'm a uh, vegetable, and then I am an uncontrollable type of flower guy because I love sitting in the garden and just watching bees and pollinators just whiz around and have a grand time. Um, I am one of those guys though that uh, started digging up my front yard because I did not like grass. So I'm slowly encroaching inward on this small little space of grass that I still have in hopes that eventually I will completely get rid of the grass. I don't, I'm, I'm past that stage, but uh, nothing better than being out in the garden. Ask my wife, she has plenty of jobs and things for me to do, but I somehow seem to get out in the garden bright and early. And uh, then I'm able to tackle some of those other more important duties like uh, changing filters and things like that. But um, nothing, I, I love perennials, uh, great for annuals, but it, when you have grandkids, it's also great to pull out that little box of seeds and give them a little plot of land and they just, they just love it. My little grandson has got a wheelbarrow and uh, he's my number one helper. So there's so much to gardening and uh, with, with, as in life, your gardens change in times, you know, everything changes, you kind of move into a different phase. You get tired of the grasses and the grasses get moved to the back. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, I can't say enough about it. As Lizzie would say, you know, it's nothing better than being in the garden as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Hey, thanks to you all. Thanks to four of you who spoke. <laughs> um, I was going to speak, but we are running out of time, but I want you to notice my monarch. Um, so on to our uh, speaker for today. <clears throat> um, I got to know Jenny Brown from Audubon Naturalist Society when it was called that. Now it's called Nature Forward. And uh, Jenny has been working. Um, she's as I she, Jenny's in, it was helping me with my garden right now. And so I'm very grateful to her. Um, so <clears throat> Jenny was telling me a while ago that she first learned about gardening from her grandmother and that she would work in the garden with her. And her grandmother was very passionate about gardening and was a great love for her and that carried over to Jenny. Uh, Jenny then later went on to get her uh, master gardener certification and she'll tell you a little bit more about that um, and then worked for a number of years as the native plant garden specialist at the Audubon Naturalist Society as I mentioned Nature Forward and now she has her own garden consulting business <clears throat> um, and continues to take classes to stay current with what's going on um, in the native plant world. So I think um, if, if you'd like to say any more, Jenny, about your background, uh, please do. But we welcome Jenny Brown to speak to us today about learning about how, to, how we can do better growing native plants. Thanks, Jenny. One minute, Whoa. computers. How are we looking? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, maybe I'll do that too. Oh, and you know what? Just a little test thing. Got to see, it's been a while since I've given a talk. Okay, yeah, my little arrow is there, so I know how to advance the slides. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for this introduction and for this chance to talk to this room that sounds like you already know a lot of that, but it, the compensation for knowing a lot of that is I often go to lectures or I'll see a Zoom thing online. And I got to admit, at my, at my age, it's kind of fun. Like, I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. I did not know that. Good. Now I do. So <laughs> I'm hoping that you will um, take this talk in that spirit, that you'll feel really great about the things you knew and the plants you recognize. And then if there's one or two little things that are new to you, you that you'll take that away with you. Um, so let me uh, advance. Like this, uh, the slideshow that was running. Uh, one of the whys in my book is to have the chance to go out in your garden and see who else is visiting all the wildlife and try to capture pictures of that. So here's a one of our many native bees, a bumblebee, and, and someday maybe I'll learn what all the bees are, but turns out there's an awful lot of native bees, so, and, but it's on a Joe Pieweed uh, blossom, so, so 
a lot of pretty pictures in the beginning and then I'll get to the meat of why these pictures are here. So this one is a Monarda with a possibly a honeybee. Turns out my neighbors on our street, not pandemic related changes. We have chickens and we have um, honeybees and many of the honeybees come to my garden. So I get the benefit of that. Um, there is, that is a painted lady. I'm, I'm gonna look over to you, Liz, every time I'm not sure. <laughs> a painted lady. Now, full disclosure, it's sitting on a tithonia, which is a Mexican annual. Um, and then that leads to the immediate thought like, mm, natives, how wide is our circle of natives? Mexico is probably wider than we consider when we talk about natives, we want it to be New England up, I mean, the whole East Coast up into Canada, but this is an annual, it's not invasive and the butterflies love it and it's gorgeous. So I say that's okay. Uh, this is a native plant. This is tick seed, which comes in a lot of forms all the way from the tiny uh, thread leaf one that you often see in gardens. It's a very common nursery plant nowadays. I'm happy to report. Nice thing about it is it blooms all summer. This particular kind can get eight feet tall when it's only blooming toward the end of the summer. So um, you, uh, you get to see the show at the end and that's a black swallowtail. This, oh boy, I'm gonna forget what this is called. Well, the flower I know. <laughs> the flower is the um, uh, fall aster. Um, yes. With the butterfly, yeah. Do you know the butterfly? The buckeye, yes. Okay. So these are all come. These are all plants in my garden, and these are all the visitors I've captured. And and I I don't know about you all, but this time of year, when I'm sitting out in my backyard, I always only once or twice see in the early spring what's either a comet or a question mark. They're very similar looking. And it's like, okay, spring is officially here. And I never see them again. <laughs> you know, I only see it once, it stops by. Here's the other thing that you may notice as you grow your gardens, is you don't, at least, okay, maybe my, just my experience and my conjecture is that the butterflies that are arriving now that have overwintered in various ways and they can do amazing things. They can be under the bark of trees through the winter. There's lots of strategies to survive the winter. They're way up in the trees. So that is a strong reason to have trees. I think they're putting their caterpillars up there and they're not coming down to the ground very often. But I do see lots of butterflies by August, September, October. So again, never looked into this, but it seems to me the, the remarkable difference in amount of population is that they, they're finding their food up there right now. Okay, same, almost similar photo that, than we had earlier. That's um, <clears throat> that's actually a zinnia, the out of focus one. Also a Mexican plant. Again, you have to decide if that's outside your definition of natives, uh, but it's an annual and not invasive. And then the, the, the bumblebee is on a echinacea, which blooms all summer. And there we have our monarch on. Okay, here, this is something I learned. So. I'm showing you this, this is over the course of the last 20 years. Um, I used to raise monarch butterflies using the Florida swamp milkweed, not swamp milkweed, just milkweed. Turns out that wasn't a good idea. There's some controversy about whether or not that misdirects the, you know, so it gets complicated. So I no longer grow the, the Florida version of the plant. I do have common milkweed which has its own drawbacks is, I, I'm hoping this is okay. I'm gonna invite people to respond. Does anyone have common milkweed in their gardens? And do you find that it wants to go wherever it wants to go? <laughs> yes, so yeah. It's the underground is the part I'm referring to. So it comes up like asparagus this time of year. And fortunately, it's very easy to pull. But you, yeah, if you're going to be away for the next few months, you'll come back to uh, quite a, a 
traveling um, display of the asparagus looking spears. So, um, so there are other kinds. There's the uh, butterfly milkweed and the swamp milkweed that are less. So where there's a term we use, which is called aggressive, which sounds nasty, but these are the native plants are, they're right where they need to be and they are used to being here and they are often what we call aggressive. I don't have a quarrel with it if they're easy to pull, but if they're hard to pull, I don't want them. Um, okay, so here's one of many pictures of my front yard <laughs> and what I call my fake uh, meadow. In it, there's a uh, one big grass, it's a, it's a cultivar. So this leads to another conversation, things that you may have heard. So there are native plants and there are cultivars. And the, <clears throat> hmm, now things are controversial about cultivars or they were, or they're becoming less so. If any of you have, or maybe some of you have been already to Mount Cuba up in Delaware, it's about a two hour drive from here, well worth taking an afternoon to go visit that. They have test gardens, and what they've been doing is testing cultivars. So I should define that. Cultivars are native plants, well, any plant that's been, been manipulated by humans for certain traits. So say you like, uh, Monarda is a very common one. So you've seen the lavender ones and you've seen the red ones. Those are both straight, what are called straight species natives. But then there's a lot of colors in between, like the magenta ones. I can't think of any others, right? You know, lots of shades of lavender. And those are ones that horticulturists have um, crossed and recrossed to, to make a better color, a better height, better resistance to mildew, all kinds of good reasons. Uh, and in some ways might attract the uninitiated to natives. Like the first thing I thought way back when I first started learning about natives, my first thought, and this is how far I've grown, is like, must be boring. You know, I just thought natives, ugh, how could that be interesting? So um, I think maybe a certain degree of the population feels that way. And so the manipulation to make them more dazzling might uh, might sell more, right? It's also difficult. I don't know how often you go to nurseries. They have one little section where there are natives. And I feel like if we all go and keep saying, so how come you don't have any of this? Or I really like this. That will get them asking the producers to bring more. But the other downside in my understanding of cultivars is when they're bred and they get what they want, they take all of those seeds or their, you know, however that plant started and they make many of them and there's no genetic diversity in that plant. So that if something comes along that can kill one, it kills all of them. Whereas in the native populations, they are genetically diverse and more of them will survive. Nothing will wipe all of them out. So that's the argument for the straight species and the argument for cultivars if you want those enhanced qualities. So, and the reason I put this picture in is it has a grass, it has, uh, this is fall, a, a variety of things blooming, but we ha I have the picture that says that it takes some, and I don't think you can read it from here, but you know, like 500 caterpillars to feed one baby chick. So we want the, this wildlife to come to our gardens, but it's also feeding other wildlife. So that's another reason. And that's the view from my house out to the street. Um, and this is some unwanted wildlife. <laughs> I think we all struggle with these guys. And we finally succumbed and we've put up a deer fence this year because we were wrapping everything and we immediately kind of missed them. It was a herd of five that would come by regularly and lay down under our maple tree. But um, now we see them through the deer fence and say, see you later. <laughs> um, okay, so... When thinking, uh, the wherefores are that when you're thinking of making a change to your gardens, you want to think about the four zones that plants grow in. And the lowest one is ground cover. And there are not very many 
uh, evergreen ground covers, but there are ones that will pop up in the growing season and that's fine. And the reason that we love ground covers is we don't, it drives out the weeds or, you know, prevents the weeds from growing. The other really good reason, who here hates to spread mulch? mulch? <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> and the idea is that eventually, and we're not sure that constantly putting new mulch on our beds is a great idea environmentally. It, you know, think of the trucks arriving, the bags, all those reasons, plus our labor. So we advocate for people finding lots of ground covers that may die back in the winter, but spring up in the, you know, early spring and go through to the fall and prevent as much, you know, we don't have to do as much weeding. So this is um, wild ginger. It likes the shade and um, it's a lovely plant. Here are two other kinds. On the left is a native pachysandra. And actually with our climate change, mine, a good number of the plants actually last all the way through the winter. So it's not completely, um, uh, you know, doesn't completely disappear, but that's a great plant to replace uh, the non-native. And then on the right is also one that emerges in the spring and likes shade and that's um, Tiarella. The common name is foam flower. And, I, and there's a lot of cultivars of that kind too, that uh, the leaf is what I love most about it. Um, and then beyond ground cover, we go to the perennials and they can be anything from the one on the right um, is called Decentra. And reason to have it in my book is that it blooms all summer long. So you've got little pink uh, blossoms, good long time. Um, the one on the left is called uh, Zizia, Golden Alexander, mm -hmm. yes. And um, it's blooming now. Some of these pictures I just took this week when I made this PowerPoint. Um, it spreads, okay, so here's your aggressive thing again. It spreads easily and fills in a big area, but not too hard to pull out. So if it starts going where you don't want it to go, you're okay. Uh, and then we saw lots of examples of this. The one on the left is the Virginia bluebells. It's what's called ephemeral. So it's blooming now and it will die completely back, leaves in included um, and disappear. But it is a nice color for this early spring. Um, and then the one on the right is um, uh, the tick seed I mentioned, the Coreopsis tick seed that probably anybody have this in their gardens? Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, up in the top corner is the blossom of a violet, which I'm sure everybody has in their yards. And I am certainly guilty of thinking that I had to get rid of them early on in my gardening career. And number one, that's impossible. <laughs> number two, they're native and they are a good ground cover. So I would leave those violets if you can bear to. Um, moving later into the summer. So, so now, so you not only are gardening for the spring, but you're gardening for the summer and the fall. And so you need things that bloom at all those times to feed the pollinators. This is one of my favorites on the left. That's Culver's root, very well behaved plant, about four feet tall. Bees love it. Um, well, by well behaved, I mean, it doesn't spread crazy. It just does its thing. Um, and then it needs a good amount of sun. And then the other, the Plants on the right are anise hyssop. That, that guy does spread, but I don't mind because the butterflies love it, um, mixed with some zinnias and some of the, the scarlet monarda. So it seemed like a nice combo. And there's a closer picture of the anise hyssop, which for tea makers, it is apparently very nice tea. Um, so humans can use it too. And this is another combination, again, with my Culver's root and the lavender form. Now, this is a cultivar of the lavender um, monarda. It's usually a more lavender pink, and this is a pinker pink. And I had to have this one. It's called Marshall's Delight because my oldest son is named Marshall. <laughs> so. Oh, and that one was bred. So often, monarda has the problem of powdery mildew. There's a white 
dust on it by the end of the season, Marshall's Delight um, allegedly has less of a problem with that. So, okay, so, so, so far we have two of the elements in the garden. We have ground cover and we have perennials. Moving on to shrubs, this is a oak leaf hydrangea with, probably can't see it from here, there's a butterfly on it, but also non-native tiger lilies behind it. Um, they just happen to be there. And actually they've died out in my garden now because it's gotten too shady. But oak leaf hydrangea is also one of those natives that's not actually native to right here. It's more, I believe more of a Southern plant, but it does well here. Smells wonderful, long lasting blooms. Uh, good, good shrub to have. This is one of my um, all time favorites. Right now, it looks the way it does on the left. This is Father Gila. Um, and I, wouldn't you know, I don't have a picture of the leaf part. So this is one of those that's called three season value because it's gorgeous in the spring. One of the earliest things, they have these white bottle brush uh, flowers on it. Then this kind, actually, there's ones that are like blue mist or they have the word blue in them and the leaves are rather blue. So if you want that element in your garden um, and then it fools me every year, the middle photo is it starts to turn that color and I think, oh, it's not gonna do it again this year. And then boom, it does that beautiful uh, red orange for weeks before it drops its leaves. So yeah, mm -hmm. Father Gila, yeah. F-O-T-H-E-R-G-I-L-L-A. And there are cultivars of this that are bred to stay shorter. Uh, you know, all kinds of qualities. Um, it could be that cultivars of shrubs and trees are not as much of an issue in terms of you're probably not gonna have a whole forest that gets wiped out. Whereas definitely for the perennials and the ground cover, if it's a cultivar, you're risking that you lose it all. So one, one uh, cultivar that comes to mind that's very popular is the powwow echinacea. Does anybody have that bright, um, just a more intense color. Echinacea is that kind of dusty mauvey pink. A lot of people don't care for that. And so there are all these other range of colors, but they may not last as long. This is a winter berry, and this is a cultivar because the berries are sort of orange. Um, usually they're red. This is high wildlife value because those berries persist through the winter, and after a freeze, the uh, birds come and eat them. So it's valuable for the birds, and it's a beautiful plant. This is uh, Leucothui. It has weird names like dog, hob dog hobble uh, because it's toxic to your pets. So I can't al always recommend that, but it's an evergreen shrub. And Jane, I wish she was here. She has the most gorgeous example of one in her back garden. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, these are two versions of, so on the left is a cultivar of um, inkberry, Ilex glabra, very popular plant now that I tell everyone to, if they have, they're struggling with boxwoods or Japanese um, holly to switch to this because it's carefree, it's high wildlife value. This is a cultivar on the left that's meant to stay only three to four feet. So if you have a spot where you don't want it covering your windows someday, um, you would go with that. The one on the right is a straight species uh, version and you can see I think they promised six feet and now it's at eight feet in my front yard so you know there you go um, it also people don't like it which I don't quite understand is that it has what we call bare legs so the stems at the bottom don't have leaves on them but I prefer that because then there's room to grow things down down there there's my house again, that, that's Monday when I took this picture. And this is an example, I've moved on to trees, but I haven't labeled it that. So that's a red bud on the left and a, a Cornus Florida white dogwood on the right, both um, high wildlife value and both native and considered understory trees. They're never gonna get to the 40 foot size. So if you're looking for something a bit smaller, a little more in control, Red buds, they're everywhere. The, the 
Blossoms are edible. You can throw them in your salad. Nice for color. It doesn't have a lot of taste, but um, perfectly edible. Um, they don't have a long life. So, you know, when you know you're putting them in, you, you figure 15 years and you'll have to be replacing it with something else. Um, here is a silky dogwood. And this would be a plant for somewhere in your yard where you don't mind it going wild because it will readily start new. You'll have a thicket in no time. But it has blueberries in the fall, and the birds love that too. So that's the reason to have that. And that's, of course, an American holly. Um, that's a great plant to have if you don't mind the sharp thorns. And here is um, Sweet Bay Magnolia. Comes in two versions, and I got both. This one said 40 feet, and I think it's at 50 now. Uh, Semi-evergreen, so it does lose you know, half its leaves in the winter, but um, heavenly uh, blossoms, smell of the blossoms. Um, and then there is a kind that is getting used much more in commercial uh, landscapes, and it's I'm going to say max 10 feet and multi-stemmed. So I recommend that one for a smaller area, but great plant. And then a plant that's been in my backyard since we moved there 30 years ago, plain old maple and can't, can't beat a maple. So, but of course that's 70 feet tall. So, um, so those are the four areas that you want to have things growing that are native uh, to provide. Now the other aspirational goal, and I'm going to tell you right now, I have not achieved it. Doug Tallamy, who maybe many of you have heard of, and if you haven't read his books, I recommend it. He wants everyone to go 70% native to 30% non-native in their gardens. Um, I don't know if, like, is he basing that on the volume of a tree versus, you know, a plant down here? I would make it if, if, if that's what he means. But if he means 70% of different varieties, I'm not there yet. So um, just gradually taking out the stuff that I mistakenly put in and now, and now I want to get rid of. Um, and here's one last picture on a Maryland uh, black-eyed Susan. And that is a skipper. Now skippers, there's lots and lots of skippers. They're not particularly... Uh, dazzling looking, shall we say, but um, they're, and they're more of a Southern thing. They're moving up with climate change. They're moving up this way and adapting, um, but they're delightful. They're wonderful to see in the garden. Okay. So what I have, what I have with me are sheets that, um, and a couple of options. So I can give a set to Carolyn and she can make multiple copies for everyone and or I recommend in our paperless environment that you all come up and take photos of all of these and then you'll have them on your phone and you can email them to yourself or somewhere that, because if, if it's a piece of paper, I'll keep it for a while, but I'll lose it. So um, the first uh, area to work in your gardens is to identify if there's any ones that really shouldn't have and get and take them out. And I extend this all the way to weeds. So when I'm planting in the spring, if there's a weed growing there, clearly it was happy. So that's where I usually put the good plant. Then you're, then I'm only digging one hole. <laughs> so, um, so I just have these uh, these next ones as exam uh, examples of what it will look like if you just take a picture with your phone. And then then I imagine most of us have shady gardens. Uh, you know, with the in, the the ages of our houses, you know, the trees have grown up. So there's a whole wonderful set of um, shady garden native plants, two sides, and then sunny native plants. And then uh, the rain, has anyone participated in the Rainscapes program or do you know what it is? Yeah. So Rainscapes, they're incredibly overloaded. I don't know how long their backlog is, but it's probably years and years, but they will come and assess your garden, especially if you have a stormwater issue. And that means your basement flooding or your neighbor's basement flooding or you know any of those things or erosion down to a stream. 
and they will give you recommendations for building gardens or infrastructure to to mitigate that stormwater issue. So um, I recommend Rainscapes going to their website, see if they're if they're making assessments, you know, how how many years out they are, but um, they're a wonderful program. They've made this list money of the same ones, which might be interesting to you, like, oh, they both say, you know, asters or something. So better get asters. So. Um, but so there, there, that sheet is what you have available to Let's take pictures of. I'll spread them out here. I would give them to you and I could give you some, but I don't have enough for everyone. And as I say, if I leave a set, maybe you all can make them available to people. Does that, does that sound all right, Carol? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I said, this is the how is to take photos of the flyers I brought and ask for native plants at your favorite nurseries um, and just be persistent, you know, like how come you don't have these, you know, um, and maybe they will start uh, getting them to um, stock them. The other thing that's happened in the last five, six years, there is a, and I should have put that on the slide, um, there's a company called IZEL, I-Z-E-L, which sells so they are the go-between between the nurseries who do not want to deal with the public showing up and buying three of their 5,000 plants. Um, but they've made an arrangement that they buy, they will sell plugs, which are small plants, very small plants, but very tough um, in 50 or 72, but not all. And, and this could be an idea of your eco committee. You could maybe, if you all had enough uh, had a wish list, shall we say, you could all buy together a, a flat of 72 of something and each of you gets five or, you know, some number like that. They're, so they're much more economical. they maybe end up being four to five dollars per plant. Um, they also now sell quartz and, and larger amounts. I think the minimum for quartz is uh, eight of them. And they're you might look and say, you know, they're like $14 a piece. Oh, that's no better than the nurseries. The advantage for them is that it's the, they have a wider selection of native plants that you might want, whereas the nursery may or may not have them. So um, just Google I-Z-E-L plant. It has some, you know, there's other I-Z-Ls, but it, you'll, it'll be clear to you which one it is. And then just uh, page through and see if there's anything you want to order. Anyway, uh, Visit gardens like the Nature Forward one, uh, Mount Cuba Center, as I mentioned, it, Hillwood Gardens now has native plant areas. Most gardens do. Um, I did hear a lecture this spring about a new place outside of Philadelphia. I'm not gonna remember the name of it, but um, they're all committed to, to doing natives. But I, I would say Mount Cuba is the preeminent uh, one that has gardened vast spaces like acres and acres, whereas other ones have much more controlled amount of space dedicated to them. Um, and as I said, things are aggressive. Who gardens with golden ragwort? Hacara aurea, yeah. So you have plenty of volunteers, don't you? You have plenty, uh, plenty to share. And uh, it's a plant that just goes crazy, but it's a wonderful ground cover. It's blooming right now, a yellow blossom and uh, used often in stormwater mitigation um, situations. Likes the sun or the shade, dry or wet. It's really an uncomplaining plant. So um, it's getting used a lot. Um, and then, yeah, when you, when you start having too much, hand them on to someone else. Um, and this is, a, oh, Here's another place to visit. If you happen to be in New York and you have the chance, go walk along the High Line because that's all native plants too. And that's gorgeous. Um, and that's it. That, that's all I can think of. As I said, I'm preaching to the choir here. So uh, <laughs> if um, I guess we go to Q&A now. Yes. Oh. No, and um, of course we don't do anything about removing them except making sure there's no standing water in the yard. Um, but when you invite these natives to your yard, 
the birds come. I mean, my husband and I are like nutty. We sit out there and we name the birds. We watch them building their nests and they're eating those insects and the bats too. So um, uh, I would just say if you're, and I am not particularly bothered by mosquito bites until I am. And they go, oh, I get it. They really itch. This is terrible. So, um, but yeah, I would say a bug spray or a fan is often helpful. Set up a fan outside and they can't land on you in the, in the breeze. But um, yeah, I'd let them, let them be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so that uh, the the inkberry that I mentioned, I mean the down near the ground, it will be clear, but you can put a perennial under there. Um, or the the shorter ones. Let's see if you want a taller hedge. Um, well, the other thing that I heard once in a lecture at Brookside was you never want to plant all the same thing in a row. Same reason that if just one dies, all of a sudden you got a hole and you got to put in a new one that's not going to be as big. So I recommend a variety of things. Um, so the Eastern red cedar is a great plant, needs, needs a good amount of sun. Um, there is a native um, thuya, I'm trying to think of what the common name for that is. They're also an evergreen, Google thuya and you'll see T-H-U-J-A. And that will uh, give you some options for, there's kinds that are eight feet tall and others that get to, you know, 30 feet tall. So you, depending on what you want. i um, trying to think of other evergreens. Bayberry, yeah, that would work, yeah. Yeah, bayberry, yes, yeah. Um, so if you were to make a trip to Nature Forward, that, re that reminds me now that, um, we have examples. So we happen to be at the confluence of three different ecotypes regions. So we're in the coastal plain, we're in the Piedmont, and we're in, sort of in the mountain. It's a little further west of us. All of the plants that live in those seem to happily intermingle. I haven't really noticed that they don't. Uh, and Liz has a, Liz's family started a garden at Wood End years ago, and it's all those regions, we try to keep them separate, but plants have moved from one to the other. Um, so it tells me that they're pretty flexible um, in terms of um, those regions. So the reason I bring that up is a wax myrtle is a more a coastal region, but it does seem to do well here, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I um so this might be a controversial statement, but at Wood End, um yes, at Wood End, we have permission to use glyphosate that's the commercial kind that's not Roundup. Apparently the thought is that the Roundup that's sold to the public has the ingredient in it that's bad, potentially bad for humans. But if you do the, so it might be a matter of hiring a pesticide, a herbicide company, because they're the only ones licensed to do it and see if spraying will help. Um, yeah, but if they keep, if you have neighbors that have it, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Question? Okay, oh, there's one more. Did you get them? Right, yes. Yeah. They're not native, no, but I'm jealous because I've tried many times and I've never got them to take, so. <laughs> but they're not uh, invasive, so yeah, you'll see what's considered, they're not invasive. 
Yeah, it's seeds dropping um, and they need a period of cold. So yeah, I think the wind blew them. They got their cold. They got all the conditions they needed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. They're not native, no. Mm -mm. Mm. Come back. Right. How, how tall are they? Do you want four to feet? Uh huh. Um, and do, do they lose their leaves, right? So in the winter, are they just, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I would do combination of things. Um, so maybe some of the Father Gila. Oh, and I didn't even, huh, should have taken a picture of that. Um, Itea virginica, great plant. And I think probably pretty salt tolerant. And the beauty of the internet, you can just put in anything and it'll tell you now, of course, do you believe them? They're, if they're trying to sell it to you, I don't know. But um, but there are plenty of websites like um, uh, uh, North Carolina Extension, probably Maryland Extension. Um, you can go to extension sites <clears throat> and they'll have a submit and, um, you know, ask them about it. But they also if you put in the plant name, they'll, they'll give you the characteristics. Yeah. So I would check on that. Yeah. No clock on the wall. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. And I just want to say um, thanks to those of you who brought in plants to share. Um, I did bring in some of the little lavender um, monarda back there you can help yourself with. If you brought in plants, just stand up for a second and identify yourself and tell us what you brought in. Bob Uhar, I, we'll start with you. The kales and the little uh, packages, but you will recycle the plastic bags. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Yes, Lizzie, you brought in? Some ajuga from Lizzie. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very much. Barbara? Okay, thank you, and yes. Thank you, thank you all. So in terms of um, everyone having an opportunity, please just take one plant, unless you wanna hang around for 10 minutes and see what's left. And if you brought one, I think you get the first option to take something else, um, but uh, we'll share them. And thank you all for bringing, and I just wanna identify Liz Jones sitting here in the front is responsible for, with her family for planning planning and planting the native uh, Blair Garden um, at Woodend. So we're, we're grateful. That's been around for a while. And that's one that Jenny spoke about. And Jenny, you're going to be spreading out the forms here. And then, um, so help yourself there. And uh, Jenny will have these spread out. So you can get your camera, get your phone. We've got a few minutes if you're going to the 1115, a few minutes. Um, and yeah, get photos. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>